<clears throat> so this last move of God is not going to be in this church. We might be looking for the supernatural, although we see the supernatural, the, the, the change of your character is a supernatural event. Amen? But he's saving the best for the rest out there. So you're going to see legs growing out, abos popping in. But he doesn't want you to receive the glory. As long as your character is of the old man in some measure, then you're going to receive the glory. So this ministry is to process you so that you can have the character of Christ so that he gets all the glory when he sends you out there to raise someone from the dead. Are you ready for that? Yes. And listen, love is the only thing that can change you. Love is the only thing that can change you. Listen, it changed me. It came down. After Paul prayed and got me into that church, it came down, and that was the last thing I remember. I don't remember Gene Hall anymore. All I remember is that I am in Christ now. I'm in Jesus now. So, love advances the kingdom of God. Like Tanika said, it's so easy to die to self once you have encountered love. It's so easy. So, I'm going to teach on why did Jesus come for a little while. And then I'm going to, uh, but first I'm going to put how to know God's will. How many of you want to know God's will? How many of you are in a situation right now that you need to know God's will? I was in worship this week, and the Lord poured it in me. My hand started writing. I put it in my bag, and then he told me to give it to the spots class Tuesday. It was past Tuesday, and he told me to give it tonight, so it's a simple thing. If you don't know God's will, you're in trouble. The devil's going to keep you up for a repeat performance. You'll be going by the same relationships, doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, broke, busted, and disgusted, I say all the time. Keep you in that realm. Listen, nobody is supposed to be poor. Nobody. We teach you. Mason's an awesome teacher. He's teaching men uh, on, a, on a book, How to Be a Billionaire. How to be a billionaire. Listen, if I didn't have my Ferrari, my Porsche, my Range Rover, all this kind of stuff, I would not have a testimony. That is a testimony of life abundantly in Christ. I don't drive that much. I drove in the night because I make sure it runs. They just sit there until the Lord says, drive it. So I want to tell you that testimony because last summer, some guy was walking by my home from the beach, and he came up to me. I was outside doing something. He said, could, could you do me a great big favor? I said, what's that? He said, I got a 90-year-old aunt, and all she wants for her birthday is to ride in that car right there. I said, why? She said, because he said, because her name is Ferrari and she's never rode in one before. So I think it's, I think God wants to get her before she goes. Because we're going to be talking about Jesus. I remember when Carrie drove it the first time. We were headed to the bank. I was telling him how good the Father is. All he just wants to do is enjoy things with us. And when I said that, the glory of God came in that car, and Carrie weeps anyway, but he really weeped. He felt the presence of God. That's what I want to see happen tomorrow afternoon when I pick up this lady at Wilmington Island. Isn't that awesome? I'm excited about that because she don't know what she stepped into. She stepped, when she steps in that Ferrari, she just stepped into the kingdom of God. Amen. Give God some praise for that. So how can I know God's will? Everybody has a decision right now or they have a decision next week. 
And you have to know what the will of God is. So let's look at this. The best way to know the, what the Bible is the way that, the best way to know His will is to know His know your Bible. But what if I'm a born again Christian, and I don't even know what the Word looks like yet? I just got radically saved. Let's go to the second one. Uh, let's go to the second one. Peace. Peace. Say peace. peace. I'm not talking about the peace that the world gives. I'm talking a, pe a peace that doesn't leave. It's stationary. It lives in your spirit. It's always there. When we get out of God's will, it's our regulator. I just lost my peace. Well, you better step back because you just stepped off something. Peace is chief in my opinion. Every business decision I've made, it's always been with peace. If I didn't have peace, sometimes God would tell me to walk it out, flesh it out. So I would have peace. I'd start stepping towards that thing that I'm supposed to do. And that peace would stay. But if that peace left, I'd have to back up. That's what I call fleshing it out. Or Jesus calls it threshing it out. He puts us on the threshing floor. All right, number three. Through godly counselors. You got a lot of godly counselors in this ministry that have been processed, that, uh, that have the mind of Christ. And if you want to set up a meeting and can't, can't seem to get to a decision, two of us will meet with you, not one. We're going to meet with, you're going to meet with two people. Through godly counselors. Number four, the inner voice. That still small voice. How many know about that still small voice? You know about that, okay. So that's a good sign. And in the last one, I think, I think there's six. Through visions and dreams, God speaks very clearly. I don't have dreams. Carrie does. I have visions. And Carrie's watching, he knows what I'm talking about. The book of Joel says young men have visions, old men have dreams. <laughs> That's Carrie and I's little thing. So I have visions. All my visions are open visions. My eyes are open, just like I saw Robin there, and I, I saw this. Oh, I love that gift. I can be walking around, you remember the old thing you look through with the, to see something and you click the thing, you see another thing, you click the thing, that's how it works with me. I could be talking to you, it goes click, I'm seeing something totally different about you. Amen. So that's, that's a vision and dreams is how he speaks. And the last one is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Man, you can trust that. If God gives you a desire for something, that desire is right here. That is the first witness that came from heaven. But the other two witnesses are going to come from the outside to you. Okay, remember that. So if you're looking for a new car, a new house, or a man, or a woman, or whatever you're looking for, you know, there's going to be a witness. I gave the testimony. I'm in the grocery store most of the time. Well, not most of the time, but, you know, I'm, I buy the groceries in the house. Listen, Zinni's got it made. I buy the groceries. I cook the food. I iron my clothes. I wash my clothes. Just, just so she can do what she wants to do. Amen. <laughs> Look at these two right here. <laughs> But listen, if I hadn't done that, she would not have grown the way she's grown. That's called service. That's what it's called. I couldn't wait till I got married so somebody could cook for me.
but God. Now, he has graced me to cook like a, like a chef down at the Hilton. He hadn't, he, he, they ate my spaghetti, that's about it. The goulash, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Brown. So, so um, then he always asked me, what did you put in this? I say, love. She said, no, what did you put in it? I say, love. Love has a special ingredient. It's, it's led by the Spirit. But I looked like a true chef when that f kitchen's finished. She, she, she volunteered to clean up. I got food everywhere. <laughs> on the floor, onions, spaghetti stuff on the countertop, on the cabinets. Man, I'm just going at it. Having fun. <laughs> but I do all those things. And I do it with joy. Because what I see it's done for her. It's my reward. It's my reward. So, I don't think she's worth listening, so... So listen, put Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Such surrender has it. This, this surrender has a guaranteed guidance. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Which heart is he talking about? Which heart? Cardia, this heart. You got two hearts. Numa, cardia. Only one of them breathe. Only one of them pump blood. The other distributes it. And that's the cardia. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? Direct your path. All you got to do is trust him. All you got to do is lean on his understanding and not yours. And it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. How do you do that? You just say, Jesus, I acknowledge you in this decision. That's all it takes. That's a guarantee that he's going to direct your path now. Next one. Testimony is the reward of God doing God's will. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. So why did Jesus come? I want to teach this little short message, and we're going to have some power night here for those who can stay. If you can't, you can go. My, part of my apostolic office is to exercise the power. To, to exercise the power. And you might be wondering what level 7 power is. Level 7 power is that these these the, the, that you are flooded with God? That's what level seven, so so level seven power means that you are flooded with love. Nothing else is coming from you. No attitude. No complaining. No fears. None of this. Nothing but love. Is coming from you that's level seven power flooded with God and that's what's going to change the world that's what's going to change Savannah it's not going to be miracles it's not going to be gifts it's not going to be healings it's going to be a flooding of God's love when you step into a room and don't even say anything it's just bellowing off of you Amen. There's no blood clots. So why did Jesus come? <clears throat> Four reasons. To save the lost. Is this on PowerPoint? Yep. Save the lost. Next one. To re restore relationship with the Father in heaven. Now how can you define that? How can you define that? I didn't know. I got saved, got born again, but I did not know I was supposed to have a relationship with the Father. 
I did not know that was the primary reason that Jesus came to save us, to restore that relationship that was lost in the garden. You will get to the place where you know the Father's voice. You'll know the Son's voice. And you'll know the voice of the Holy Spirit. You will get to that place. That's part of maturity. There's no more repeating. Where Father says to Jesus. Jesus says to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says to you. But if he can talk to you directly as a friend as a son we are ambassadors for Christ but we are sons of God we have to remember that when I go out of my house I'm an ambassador for Christ I'm going to enforce the victory today I'm going to confront demons I'm going to love I'm going to do everything to enforce the victory of the cross and when I get into my war room I'm going to have intimacy with the Father where he just sets on me and you weep and you weep because that love is so great. So number three, <clears throat> why did Jesus come? To live, to bring heaven on earth, to, to bring heaven on earth, for us to live heaven on earth. Now what would be your de definition of you living, living heaven on earth? What would be your definition? Who can answer that? Kingdom come. Living heaven on earth. What? Kingdom come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it, but what is the experience of living heaven on earth? Everything that you say is the right answer. Because living heaven on earth is all inclusive of everything. But the answer I was looking for, living heaven on earth is the Father living in you. Which he hadn't done that yet. And maybe some of y'all have. <clears throat> but he said 80% of the church is not, is not there yet. They have the Holy Spirit living in them but not the Father and the Son. So you say, where do they live? They live in your soul. How do they get there? Change. Change. The Holy Spirit was sent to renovate the soul. The house needs to be renovated for the new occupant. And the new occupant is the Father and the Son. He said it in, in the book of John. He said, my Father and I want to make a home in you, but first I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to renovate that house. Can you imagine the whole Godhead on the inside of you? Can you just imagine? Can you just, I mean, I... I love the Holy Spirit. I know the Holy Spirit. I know what He's doing, where He's going. What all the, but can you imagine that three people would live in you? That's not schizophrenia. That's three people. Three persons that very few people understand the Trinity. But it's real. They all have their different ways of doing things, saying things. Uh, so, so when you go through a trial and the enemy is adverse to the truth that the Holy Spirit is trying to implant in you, the Holy Spirit is bringing that truth in to unveil the Son because without Him being unveiled, you can't see the Father. And if you'll just hold on to that truth in your trial... You'll enter his rest. And that rest is a sign that the Father and Son have just made a home in a measure in you. So then the enemy comes as a tempter. 
He comes as a tempter. He comes as an angel of light to pull you out of your rest just before the healing is complete. The rest is for healing. Jesus said he, he binds up, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So he's stitching that womb up. Just before that lasted, I had a vision of this. The Lord said, this is how it works. This is how the kingdom of God gets advanced through you. If you're advancing the kingdom outside of it, advancing through you first, it's going to be in vain. It's going to fall to the ground. It has to be built in you first. So the tempter comes like an angel of light saying, hey, you, you've been resting too long. It's time to ha start a house of peace. <laughs> it's time to start a house of peace. It's time to get on the street and cast out a devil. Yeah. The devil is not the one that releases you. Your spiritual leader, your spiritual father is the one that's, that's going to release you out of that rest into your promise. The enemy wants to get a seed in that wound just before it's closed up. Don't release yourself without submitting to authority. Too many people have released themselves and the devil got the seed right back in there and now they're worse off. I've seen them. They're worse off. They're totally deceived. If they would just submitted, say, look, I'm, somebody came to me wants to do a house of peace. Should I do a house of peace? I would get that witness because you're this... You're in this house. You're in this family. The father will get a witness. I said, no, you better hold up a little while. Jesus is trying to heal that wound in you. Once the wound is healed, you're released. And then opposition comes. So adversity, temptation, and opposition are the three signs you should be looking for. We got, the Lord released me to buy a yellow bluff. What came? It certainly wasn't temptation. It was opposition. That's how I know I'm on track. Because the devil at this point is opposed to the authority that's in place. That's what opposition is. The beauty part about opposition from ad adversity is the adversity is no longer in me. But opposition is all around me. That's my life. It's always that way. But I wouldn't have it any other way because it lets me know I'm on track. That I'm on the right path to my next destiny. Amen. Amen. Write those three same things down. You, you, you will have success in that. So to live heaven on earth is for the Father to live on you, live in you. Number four, to live with him eternally. So Jesus is the testimony of God. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. <clears throat> Before we go into testimonies, any more testimony, we might have some more at the end after the power moves. But I'm going to teach on, on, on four. Every Christian has four commands. Every one of you have four commands. This is what you're going to be accountable to when you meet Jesus. These are four commands that he's given you when you meet Jesus. Isn't that going to be a glorious day when you see him face to face? Yeah. I'm asking him for the rapture to come before I die because I want to, be, I want to experience that rapture. I want to see everybody lifted up together in the cloud. Wouldn't that be awesome? 
There's four commands. The command is not for you to exercise your gift. Here's the four commands. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love him with all your heart. He's talking about this heart. How do you do that? How can you show him that you love him with all your heart? What is it? What is it? What? What's the answer? How can I show him that I love him with all my heart? Worship. Worship. I see some of them run up here to worship. Some of them stay back there to worship. But as long as you're worshiping. All right. Love him with all your heart. Love him with all your soul. How, do you, how can you show God that you love him with all your soul? Obedience. Obedience to the word that he showed you. And strength. How can I show him that I love him with all my strength? Love in action. Love in action. Next one. Love others as you love yourself. I'm sure Tanika has come to a place that she loves others a lot more now than she did before. Because the first thing God does, he gets you to love yourself. That's the first thing he did with me when Paul and I went to that church. And I came out of there a different man. I like this guy now. I didn't like him before. He always got me in trouble. This man doesn't. Okay, so what's the next one? Go and make disciples. How many of y'all have actually made a disciple? Just raise your hand in your mind. I don't want to see this. No. <laughs> How long have we been in the church? Have we made a disciple? It's a commandment of God. We got to give an account for it. This ministry makes disciples. We're starting a whole round of discipleship again. I'm discipling four or five men at a time. Lee's going to do the women. I decided not to do it one-on-one -on -one because I like a small group where everybody can interact and hear each other's answers and everybody learns differently. So that's, that's in the works. Make disciples. Number four, go and preach the kingdom of God to the lost. We are responsible. Listen, you are responsible for the lost. We're so worried about what we don't have. I know that man over there, Paul Hodge, he has a hunger for the lost. I'd be eating French fries with him at McDonald's and he's preaching to the people behind me. What's in your journal? Who have you saved lately? Who have you won to Christ lately? It's not just for the evangelists. It's for everybody. It's a commandment. You can cut in hair. Cut hair. You can lead them to Jesus cutting that hair. So what are we saving them from? What are we saving the lost from? Say hell. So what is hell like? Most people don't know what hell's like. Because the, the, the churches don't out, they don't teach it anymore. You know why it's not taught anymore? Because the ones that taught it year, many years ago taught it without love. Their characters had not been developed yet. It wasn't without love. You can't win anybody over without love. So let's look at this. What is hell like? Next verse. 
And being in torments in Hades, which is hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. So, so somebody was in hell. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham. So hell can see us. Think about that. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Next verse. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. What? Oh my God, I just felt the compassion of Jesus. What family member is not saved in your home? That's where they're going. The fire was so hot, he's looking to Abraham and said, send Lazarus to bring some water to cool my tongue because it's in the flames. Now these are flames that are unquenchable. You're going to live the rest of your life eternally, either in heaven or in the pit with flames. And by the way, there's a pit, there's a pit. There's, the hell is uh, nothing but a bunch of pits. And they're five foot wide, five foot deep. If you're not born again, that's where you go. The flames are in the pit. And you stay in that pit for eternity. And you feel those flames. We can't even handle getting our finger burned. Can you imagine feel the flames? You're going to feel the flames. Who, who's your, who, who, who works with you that's, that's not saved? If God puts somebody in front of you, that's the one. And he's saying you're going to be accountable to this one. You're going to answer to this one. How many evangelists we have in here? We have a bunch of evangelists. So hell is what? Say real. real. Hell is real. So there are two descriptions of hell in the Bible. Number one, what does it say? It's a burning fire. This one right here, she's, she's doing what God commanded her to do. She's snatching them out of the fire that's here so they don't have to go to the eternal one. You can be saved and still go to hell. Did you know that? You have to be saved and born again. It's two different events. You can be rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and placed in the kingdom of light and still go to hell. Why? Because you were never connected back to heaven. The born again experience connects you back to heaven. Your spirit is connected back to heaven. You will not go to hell. You might end up in the second coming if you don't get your mind renewed and your character changed. But you're still going to heaven unless you deny Christ in the, in the great tribulation. All right, let's go to the next one. So Jesus often used the word Gehenna to describe hell. Go ahead. Gehenna was the refuge dump outside of Jerusalem that was always on fire. He would notice it. It was always on fire. Next. Jesus said hell was a place of worms, maggots, fire, and torment. So when, if the person that, 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 that's lost is in this pit with maggots, worms, fire, and torment. 
Can you imagine? I'm trying to put the fear of the Lord in you. Is it working yet? No. No. Gabriel said no. <laughs> All right, let's look at the next slide. From that, we get the image of a lake of fire and the concept of perpetual burning. Scripture. Next one. The ones that refuse, go back, the ones that refuse to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. There's the key. He's Lord in the born-again experience. Are probably full of remorse and torment now because they're in hell. See, and why didn't I just yield to the person that was telling me about Jesus? All I had to do was yield. You see, some people just aren't at the end of themselves yet. The reason Jesus came is because the Father saw that man had come to the end of himself and could not help himself anymore. Then he sent his son. It's still that way today. People have not come to the end of themselves. They say, I want to enjoy sin just a little while longer. I want to enjoy my sin. Just a little while longer. You could die in your sleep tonight. Let's go. Next, whatever's on the screen. So Mark, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, he's not telling you to cut off your hand. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather having, than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. See, I'm preparing you, especially our level seven people, to hit the street. So they're going to be up here exercising power, that full power. If your mind needs to be clear, if, you're, if you need healing, it's going to happen up here tonight with our level seven people. Then they're going to hit the street. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Go ahead. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Is it, didn't I read that already? Yeah, go to 46. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better. Where are we going? It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into hell. Next. Jesus also said that hell would be outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Next. Here's the, image, uh, is, here's the image of one in terrible loneliness. Separation from God and man. That's what I was experiencing the day that Paul called. I was in my deep, dark, manic, depressed state, feeling alone. It was dark. Man, it was so dark. I'd never experienced that darkness before. It just came on all at one time. And I went to the kitchen to get a knife, coming back to the room to cut my veins. And the phone rang right when I passed by and it was him. He said, I don't know what you're doing, but God show, showed me your face this morning and told me to call you now. If it had been anybody else, I probably wouldn't have said yes. He's, he'd been preaching to me for a whole year. But that was the day I came to the end of myself. That was the day. The end of yourself is when he comes. So we can be out there fornicating, committing adultery, all this kind of stuff. And 
Where do you think you're going? Here is the image is one of terrible loneliness, separation from God and man. Those who are consigned to hell will be put into inky blackness of eternity with nobody to turn to or talk to, constantly alone for eternity. You will never die. And you're not there, but they are out there. It's a commandment. Sometimes we just got to put ourselves behind us. If God has put somebody in front of you that's lost, you better, that's the time. He's going to give you grace. He's going to give you the words to say. And once you snatch them out of hell, then he's going to bless you. I feel blessed because I snatched a lot of them out of hell. I was an evangelist for a long time. Snatching them out of hell. Just being very discerning. Okay. Next. They will suffer the remorse of knowing they had the opportunity to come into heaven but turned it down. Oh, you've done your job. You just invited them to come. But they can turn it down. And that's not on your hands. What's on your hands is not telling them about Jesus. Hell was made for and reserved for the devil and angels, not you. The sad thing is we choose the devil. So we go to where he's going. We choose Jesus, we're going to go to where he's, he's at. Amen. Not human beings. Human beings were never intended to go to hell. But some will choose the devil to live through their senses. That's the key. And we'll go, and we'll go where he goes. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of everybody. But I've seen this work that she's done here lately. Amen. And God's going to bless her with every desire of her heart. Because this is his desire. That's his desire. We choose our destiny of eternity. There will be no exit from hell, no way out, no second chance. That is why it is so important to receive the pardon of God that God extends to all men through the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Give God some praise. For that. So the Lord wants to, to uh, go into about 30 minutes of praise and worship, and then we're going to exhibit some power in this place tonight. We're going to exhibit power tonight. So if you're going through something and your mind needs to be at rest, needs to be at peace, that can happen. Um, if you need a devil cast out, Robin will be standing up there. Robin's here. Whatever you need tonight, it's here tonight. Amen. If you don't think you're born again but saved, then talk to the person when you come up here that you need to be born again. And they'll lead you through a prayer directed by the Holy Spirit. Because we can call on the name of Jesus and be saved. But there's a prayer that we can pray that will lead you to a born again experience. Amen. So you can be saved and go to hell. We've had testimonies in here. People have died. They were saved. They went down. Ministers who were dead seven days, maggots coming out of their nose and mouth, were standing right here. He went to hell. And Jesus toward him, 
showed him, showed him hell. And he noticed his secretary and who else? An elder was a treasurer. His secretary and treasurer of his church was down there. And he led them to the Lord. So they were saved, but not born again. The reason they were down there, the treasurer was stealing the tithes. And the other one had unforgiveness in his heart. He was shocked that he saw them down there. He just knew they were in heaven. So God raised him from the dead for that purpose, to come tell the people. They were saved, but they went down. They were never born again. Their spirit was still dead. They were rescued from on a horizontal plane and not a vertical plane. That's what saved means. Taken from there to here. But then you got to go from here to there. <laughs> and then your mind has to be transformed. All right, so take a break, go to the bathroom. We're going to put 30 minutes of praise on, and then we're going to start ministering to all those who want healing, uh, whatever they want, whatever you're going through. Uh, just let us know what it is when you come up. Amen.